finishes the job of building the house, guess what Solomon says? The heavens of heavens cannot contain you. So let us keep it real. He said, let us not get it twisted. We're not building a house in order to tell the world, come have a conversation with God as if God is confined by that house. The house is a point of reference of which when we understand the qualities and characteristics of that house, we can derive something about the redemptive glory of God. So that's what temple is about. And we'll push into that a little bit more. I want to come back down to the earth and deal with our trajectory, our historical progression from David to Solomon and Solomon forward, because <clears throat> what we are also being um, obliged to do as we study is follow the seed. Follow the See, that's what we're being obliged to do, follow the seed. And of course, the seed is going to be fundamentally the tribe of what? Judah. I want you to keep that in mind. So we're getting ready to go right back to the issue of the monarchy, the kingdom, the monarchy. So you want to keep in mind temple, one. You want to keep in mind seed, two. You want to keep in mind monarchy, three because it's going to help you understand the chaos that we're about to talk about. It's going to help you understand that. So here's what we read in uh, second, first Chronicles 22 over in verse five, first Chronicles 22, five, there's going to be a transition point. Then we're going to be jumping to second Chronicles. And David said, Solomon, my son is young and tender and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for. I will prepare the material for Solomon to build a point of reference for God's fame to go into all the world. That's what he's stating. Right, so pause it and reflect on once again how absolutely um, significant God is to David. Right. So he doesn't get to build it, but he does get to comprehend it by revelation. Remember that God gave him the revelation. He does get to acquire the material for it. And then he does get to declare the aim and objective of it, that it might be a point of reference for men everywhere into, in the world to glorify God. And he says, therefore, Solomon, this temple needs to be exceeding magnificent. In other words, the temple should represent the character and nature of God if you know him to be exceeding magnificent. So the temple should correspond to some degree, it's the lesser toward the greater, but to some degree, the character of God, right? Is God glorious? Then what we are looking at is a faint and, and diminished but significant point of reference for the glory of God, and that would be called the temple. All right, so we're going to move from that because the text tells us, so David prepared abundantly before his what? His death. That's what that language says. So I want to show you the, uh, the brief redemptive transition from David to Solomon so that you can understand that the beloved being typified by David, pointing to who? Jesus is the one who lays down his life and God loves him for it to qualify Solomon, who now becomes another type of Christ in the resurrection, to spread the gospel of men and women, uh, to men and women, a gospel not of war, but of what? Rest, shalom. Remember I told you Solomon is the long version of the contracted version, shalom. So David is war, Solomon is rest. David's death points to the death of Christ by which he purchased for us that redemption that he spreads around the world and gathers in the stones of the building. And those stones are men and women. Are you and I not living stones in the house of God? Does that optic work for you guys? Good. So now we can read move to Solomon and uh, and, and it's going to be a uh, I'm going to be jetting through him because his study is, is long, large, and extremely important, but I, I want to kind of just build a feel between now and Friday of um, the issues of the kingdom 
from Solomon. So we go now to um, 2 Chronicles 6, 41 and 42 to reassert what I just stated about um, moving from David, the beloved, to Solomon, the point of rest. And I want to actually identify what that means in the context of 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 6, 41. Uh, now notice, uh, will you back up, uh, uh, back up to verse 40, 2 Chronicles 6, 40? Let me contextualize this. Solomon is praying to God, okay? So you just need to know that. So Solomon is going to pray to God, and he's getting ready to ask God to do something. And I want you to see what he's getting ready to ask God to do. Now, my God, let I beseech you, thine eyes be open and your ears be attentive unto the prayer that is made where? What place is that? Temple. Okay. So I want you to capture something now. Again, because, you know, we're, we're studying. We're not playing games. So we're studying. So Solomon is praying and Solomon raises a question. He says, or uh, he, he, he gives an appeal. I beseech you that your eyes would be what? Open, that's one, and that your ears would be what? Attentive unto the what? Prayer that takes place where? In the temple. What Solomon just did right there was say, God, would you be our king and priest and hear our prayers as they ascend up to you in honor of the temple? Y'all got that? All right, so the next thing that we're doing, just because this is theology, is we are understanding that Solomon is accommodating that human metaphorical language of the anthropomorphism of God. God is not a man. Therefore, he doesn't have eyes, he doesn't have ears. But Solomon is talking uh, uh, to God as if he does. Lord, would you open your eyes? So what I'm doing uh, with these people at Grace a lot is teaching you how to read the Bible naturally, but then also supernaturally, because if you don't, you can make the mistake of assuming that God is a man. God's eyes are never closed. So there's a meaning behind open your eyes. There's a meaning behind give ear to the call of your people. There's a meaning behind and Lord, do it when we pray. And there's a meaning behind, oh, and Lord, do it because of this place. If we were doing a Bible study, we would have a great time around that. Because I can sum up that, 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 that request in two words. Are you ready? In Christ. Now, this is the axiomatic principle we operate out of here in grace. So all of your New Testament <clears throat> underscores repeatedly that everything that you and I have and do is a consequence of being in Christ. And this is the language that Paul uses through every epistle. For Christ, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, with Christ. And this is what Christ meant when he says, I am the way. So Solomon is being Christocentric here, is he not? He's really calling on Jesus because Jesus becomes the anthropomorphism of God, right? And the word was made flesh. He is the God man that we honor and serve. So I'm just laying out for you how that one simple Bible verse becomes so profoundly rich in terms of study. You have to pause and give ear to it. But I do want to move on. Look at verse 41 now. So notice what it says. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God. And again, can I just keep you on the sensitivity track around anthropomorphisms? If God is everywhere present, if he's omniscient, if he fills heaven and earth, if he encompasses eternity, if he sits on the circuit of the universe. These are all Bible verses I just shared with you. OK, all of these are Bible verses. I feel heaven and earth. I sit on the circuit of the universe. I encompass eternity. I'm from everlasting to everlasting. These are what we call the incommunicable attributes of God. He doesn't share them with his creatures. No creature can say that. If God is everywhere present, why are we asking him to rise up? But there you go again. Rising up then becomes a euphemism or a metaphor for God to act. You guys got that? God, would you act? Don't just sit there. Act. So that's important to know. Now, therefore, arise, O God, into what? Now, notice what it says. Your resting place. Is that what it says? 
Who knows where that resting place is? The temple. So I'm showing you how to stay on point. The temple is God's resting place. That's where God rests in terms of his will being accepted, his will being received, his will being responded to. God rests in the temple. Why? Because the Shekinah glory is in the temple. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant is in the temple. Why? Because the cherubim are in the temple. Why? Because the high priest is in the temple. Why? Because the Levitical priesthood is in the temple. Why? Because the people of God are in the temple. Where the people of God is, that's where God is. And the temple takes on its final eschatological reality. How? In Christ. So if you were keeping up with me, here's what you would know. You would know that key, Christ is the key to God's rest. Christ is the key to God's rest. And the temple actually comports with that. So notice what Solomon, who is said to be an example of God's what? Rest. He is actually telling God to enter into his what? Rest. So is Solomon as David a type of Christ? And would not Christ be pointing to himself to call men and women to enter into that wherein God himself rests? All right. So again, if you and I were really pressing home the importance of redemption and salvation and justification and reconciliation and mercy and grace, all of that is summed up in the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubs where blood was poured for the forgiveness of sins in order that men might be reconciled to God. And upon that reconciliation, the reward is the word R-E-S-T. Does that make sense? Right, the wicked are like the troubled sea tossed to and fro and they will never find rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will rest you. So the temple is a picture of Christ and Solomon knows that the temple was designed to give sinners rest, to give rebels rest, to give fugitives rest, to give crooks rest. Does that make some sense? We find our rest in God when we know God in Christ. OK, I'm going to leave that there because I want to go on. But this really should be a real marked point for you. One of the ways that you know that you are OK in your walk with God is when you are able to filter through all of your thoughts and actions and are still cognizant that you are depending upon God in Christ as the grounds of your hope for eternity. Remember again and learn how to memorize these promises. It's not a promise, it's an indicative, but it is a promise. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is righteousness. What? Peace. Peace and what? That triad you should always remember. Christ provided that righteousness by his death on the cross. The Holy Spirit stamps the benefits of that righteousness on your heart by giving you peace. And the fruit of that peace should result in joy in the Lord, which is your strength. Right. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Why? Because I've got peace with God. Why? Because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to me freely by his grace. That's why the temple is there to lead men and women to the need for Christ and the benefits of redemption. Now, therefore, arise, O God, into your rest, you and the ark of your strength. There it is. We could say the ark of his strength is who? Christ, let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in what? Now, can you see the priests running around the temple, happy and shouting and dancing? Can you see that? Because that's what the text says they should be doing. Right. Keep that there. Tag that because I'm going to talk about this again on Sunday when we go back to Psalm 110 and look at Melchizedek. And remember what God said. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. This is a correlation to it. What does that willingness look like? I want to talk about that then. All right. So Solomon now is appealing to God to bless the work of the temple so that people would be drawn to it. And that makes all kind of sense to me. Now look over at chapter 9, verse 22. The second Chronicles chapter 9, verse, I'm sorry, sorry, I need one more verse. Verse 42, 642. <clears throat> 
I think I got an echo here. Second Chronicles 642. There should be a 42 there. Okay, here it is. Right. Oh, Lord God, turn not away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. Do you guys see it? We already know that the mercies of David are the mercies of Christ that are given to men and women to liberate them from sin and bring them into the joy of the kingdom. You will hear me repeat this on Sunday as well, because Jesus is the one with the keys of mercy. The key to the mercies of David are the keys that are given to Christ. And you and I need those mercies. He's the only one that can unlock the prison door and let you out. And if he does, it's not merit, it's mercy. You got that? If he lets you out, it's not merit. You didn't earn a thing. He just let you go because he wanted to let you go. And, and, and would not men and women who are actually guilty but get let go, not come out shouting and dancing, Woo! do you know I'm free? All right, so that becomes what he's talking about, the celebratory nature of priests. People who are closest to God. See, the priesthood is the closest group to God there is. Everybody else takes a tertiary role. The priests get to hang out with the everlasting burning. He gets to hang out with the Shekinah glory. He gets to hang out with the Chabad. And he gets to enjoy God and God gets to enjoy them because there's a mediator there that allows them to coexist with God in the midst of that flame. And the rest of the saints get to enjoy the priesthood as they are glorifying God in this expression of kinetic worship. I'll leave that there. That's exactly the way that it was meant to be. And Jesus has every reason to be adored that way. I'll pick that up on Sunday. Chapter 9, verse 22 through 30. Now, you're getting ready to look at some problems here. Chapter 9, 20 through 30, 23, uh, 22 through 30. Now, King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. Verse 23, we're going to keep walking. And all of the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. Now, stop right there. So in the first verse, what you heard, I shouldn't do it, but it's just important. If you go back to that verse, you will notice that there are two attributes given to Solomon. Wisdom and what? Riches. There you go. Wisdom and riches. Is that what it says? Now, the text is teaching me something about <clears throat> how loaded Solomon was. Now, see, I'm dating myself when I use loaded. The kids don't know this term, but us old folk do, right? Solomon had dough. And I want you to... And so what, what scripture often does is it will highlight things that if you miss, you will miss the nature of God's blessing in your life too, right? So Solomon was blessed by God with wisdom and riches because Solomon <clears throat> didn't ask for riches. He asked for the grace to be able to wisely lead God's people. What I said to you before, and yeah, this is gonna, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be pushing this, but I'm doing this anyway. What I said to you guys about blessing both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that when God blesses you, God increases you. But the idea of being blessed is to be added to. When God blesses you, he actually expands you. That's literally what the term means. Now, please listen to this. When God actually blesses you, it's in order that your expansion be observed by other people. When God enlarges you, when he expands you, it's in order that your enlargement be observed by other people so that other people can know that there is a reward for serving God. There is a reward for waiting on God. There's a blessing when you sit in your diminished state and believe that God will come through. And, and so that's what the term blessing means. It means to expand Think about every time uh, the idea of a blessing is bestowed upon someone. Remember, um, Lazarus was blessed, was he not? So he went from a diminished state of sickness and affliction and toil to absolute bliss in Abraham's bosom, did he not? And so Israel was blessed. Is not Israel called the blessed people of God? Well, they came from bondage in Egypt and slaves to actually being the crown royal of God over the world. And so when we read in Matthew chapter uh, five through seven, when Jesus says, blessed are they, blessed are they, the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, what? For they, they, they shall see God, or the, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for Christ's sake, right? For yours is the kingdom. Now watch this, he says you're blessed when you wait, 
for God to come through and resource you in your diminished state. Now, this is true all the way through. Let's see. There was a, um, I'm trying to remember that brother's name. Uh, there was a Jabez. You guys remember the prayer of Jabez? Hey, you know, our, our American Christianity is always trying to sell something. You guys know that, right? So they tried to package Jabez as a formula by which you could get blessed, right? The blessing of Jabez. How many of you guys remember that? The blessing of Jabez, right? And they, people are going to, you know, tell you if you pray the Jabez prayer, God will bless you. That's a lie. This is a straight lie. God will bless you if you don't pray the Jabez prayer. I'm just helping you, okay? See, so, so you know, when you, oh, I'm, he, oh, let me get that book. And, and this is the criminal element in, in Christianity. But what Jabez had said in that prayer was this, Lord, <clears throat> increase my lot, increase my inheritance so that the burdens that I go through don't so grieve me that I'm not able to give you honor. Now, that's a great prayer. And if you were to go back through that, you would understand that Jabez was a person that suffered a lot. And all he was asking from God was to give him just a little room to breathe. And what the text says was, and Jabez was honored above his brethren. And that's because Jabez too, Jabez in the Hebrew, was a great type of Christ. Christ starts off diminished. Christ ends up exalted. Is not Christ the most blessed person in the universe? I'm just teaching you the concept of blessing because that's what you want in your life. That's what you want in your life. You want God to bless you for Christ's sake. Don't ever not assume that there's room for you to be blessed more. Right. And that's what's going on here with our text. And so then in our in our text, we, we continue verse 23. These words. I kind of want to flow to show you Solomon. I should keep going. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. That makes Solomon now a point of reference for what we would call a paragon of wisdom. Why is everybody coming to Solomon? Because Solomon had been given wisdom by God and they heard the report of his wisdom and they're seeking him because they need wisdom. Now let's go on. And, by, and they brought every man his present vessels of silver, vessels of gold, raiments, harnesses, spices, horses, mules at a rate year by year. Now, let me ask you something. The wisdom that God gave Solomon, Solomon now is loving on human beings. Because remember what agape is? Agape is giving, right? And you give from your gift. Is that true? You give from your gift. Is that gift reciprocating Solomon? Is it reciprocating him? Is Solomon now expanding because he's giving? Can you see it in the text? This is abundantly clear. So one of the keys to blessing is when God gives you something, you give it away. One of the keys to blessing is when God gives you, if God gives you a gift, it's not for you. Now, I don't want to get stuck here because one of the real challenging uh, responses or retorts to this is like, Pastor, how can I know my gifts? I, I get that. That's a whole nother discourse. And it makes sense. You and I would want to know our gifts because if you know your gifts and you begin to operate in your gifts, you're going to be able to operate in a way in which not only others are going to be blessed, but you are. You and I are not blessed unless we're operating in the gifts that God gives us. OK, so I'm going to leave that there because the goal of every human being is to find their gifts. And then to employ them. Because when you find your gifts and employ them, here's what you're going to see happen in your gifts. They're going to actually increase you. That, that's how God works. Right? Because you and I are now functioning as receptors for God to bless other people. And it's just going to return. I'll leave that there. All right. No, I got to add one more pastoral note there. Here we go. If you want to meet miserable people. Meet people who don't give. Meet people who think everything is about them getting. You want to meet miserable people? Meet people who just spend all their lives going, give me, give me, give me, give me, like the leeches daughters of Proverbs chapter 31. They can never be satisfied. Have y'all met those kind of people? Don't be like them. If you have, repent, ask God to have you mercy and learn how to take a dollar and get four quarters and give a quarter to somebody and wait for that to reciprocate. Train you, ask God to train you 
on how to be dependent on him. Train you on how to be a vehicle of his flow. Does that make sense? To be a vehicle of his flow. Because if he ever decides to use you as a vehicle of his flow, guess what? You will never be in want. He's not going to let you supply everybody else's need and not supply you. All right, so let, let's keep going with Solomon because the boy is rolling. Verse 25. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses. This blows me away. Cherries, 12,000 horsemen. Not horses, horsemen. 12,000 horsemen. Whom he bestowed in the chariot. He had a city just for his horses. Was he large? And with, and with the king at Jerusalem, verse 26. And he reigned over some of the kings from the river even unto the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. Do you guys see what it says? He reigned over all the kings. Do you see that? So what you and I are looking at the resume and blessing of God upon Solomon. This would be categorized as we got four more verses as the glory of Solomon. The glory of Solomon. You guys got that? The glory of Solomon. Verse 27. And the king made silver in Jerusalem as what? He was so wealthy, silver was running around on the ground everywhere. People were so blessed in Solomon's day that they didn't even look at the sound. Oh, that's just silver. <laughs> oh, that's just silver. I wish. Oh, that's just silver. And cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the low plains in abundance. Verse 28 through 30. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt and out of all lands. That would be Babylon, Medo-Persia as well. Verse 29. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the visions of Edo the seer against Jer Jeroboam the son of Nebat? All right, so he's getting ready to contextualize Solomon's trouble. And this is what we have to deal with now. So what I had to do is I had to share with you Solomon's glory. But now I want to share with you Solomon's trouble because he's going to get in trouble. This is the way that the kingdom gets transitioned. So we're dealing with Solomon's glory. And now my uh, my point of reference is going to be what we call the kingdom troubled, divided. We what stand? Is that in your outline? Do you have that in your outline? OK, I didn't hear anybody. The kingdom troubled, divided. We what? Is that what y'all see? Okay, so, all right, so I'm getting ready to teach you a, 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 a spiritual principle of economics with God. I'm going to teach you why division is necessary. Division is necessary. All division, no, but some division, yes. I'm going to show you how God is going to preserve the seed through division. Now, Solomon's about to make a mess, and we will have to own that, but this is what God is going to do. So we are in... Uh, first Kings chapter 11, uh, first Kings chapter 11 and in first Kings chapter 11, we see a horrible thing occurring. First Kings chapter 11, <clears throat> I'm going to start at verse six. Are you guys there? And I'm going to walk through, uh, verse 11, and then we're going to pick up and begin our journey because we're going to get the context for which the trouble that Solomon is about to get into occurs. Now, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord. Here's an extremely important addendum, as did David, his father. You guys see that? All right. So now notice what it says. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. You got you guys got that right. He didn't always do evil, but he did evil this time. I'm going to mark this out. I've got this number 42 up here, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. All right. So as an applicate point of application, <clears throat> Solomon was a child of God, was he not? Wasn't he chosen in Christ before before he even had a being? <clears throat> what was his name before he even had a being? Jedediah. What does the Hebrew term Jedediah means? The one whom the Lord loves. Now, God loved Solomon even before he came to the planet. All right. Now, that, that, does that therefore mean that God knows Solomon was going to actually commit these atrocities that we're dealing with? Of course. 
So when God loves a person like he loves Solomon and he loved Solomon before he had Solomon and he knew when he had Solomon, Solomon was going to get crazy with all his money and all these riches. He knew he was going to get crazy. Did he know that? Did God's love for Solomon change just because Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord? Right. This goes to show the immutable nature of God's love when God's love for you is in Jesus. You guys got that? The immutable nature of God's love when God's love for you is in Jesus. See, like God always knows what we're going to do. We don't always know what we're going to do, but God always knows what we're going to do. So if God ever tells you, I love you, <clears throat> please understand he loves you knowing everything you're going to do. Now, that's remarkable because you don't even love yourself knowing everything you're going to do. And you don't know everything you don't, you're going to do. That's not necessarily good. And that's God's goodness to you, too. That'll come home in a moment. Lord, let me see everything that I'm going to do. And God says, no, I love you too much to let you see everything you're going to do. Because if you knew what you would do every time you did it, you wouldn't even love yourself. Right. So when we're talking about an immutable love that's inflexible, it has to be of a divine nature. Because sin is so horrific in terms of relationship dynamics that it requires a divine love to sustain a relationship because sin breaks everything. Did you understand what I said? So I'm, I'm going to hold on to that band just a little bit and show you why we love God and why it's necessary for the love of God to be the foundation of your existence. And it would be that sin is such a principle of destruction that it will destroy every relationship it has, including the relationship you have with yourself. That's the nature of sin. And the only thing that can handle sin is the love of God. The nature of God in his love as a redeemer of sinners because of the catastrophic nature of sin. Am I making some sense? Now, this is going to be important down the line because, you know, people will talk about sin. And they'll talk about sinners and they'll talk about people sinning. And they'll talk about not liking sinners and talking about punishing sinners. But the only remedy for sinners is the love of God in Christ. Every other asserted remedy will never fix the problem of the sinner, but the love of God in Christ. You got that? Every other solution is a false solution. It won't work. Only the grace of God. This is why what Solomon is about to do in this utter, utter insanity, God is still going to make all grace abound, even in Solomon's foolishness. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did his father David. Now, did David go fully after the Lord, his God? Absolutely. Now, stay there. Stay there. See, this is going to this is going to get you. It's important for you to know how to. Um, understand the nature of God in relationship to his people. So I'm going to make this one really simple. David did fully serve the Lord. He's a sinner. All right. So if you define fully, and that's an adjective, as impeccable, then no one ever fully serves the Lord. But if you define fully as singularly committed, to the one true and living God, that was David. See, and so what, what God looks for and produces in the life of his people is total commitment to him. Does that make sense? Right. You never heard David one time talk about worshiping other gods, putting idols up and creating Ashtoreth and, and, and all kinds of, of, of what he would call vanities and devil's heat. That's what he called them. You'd never see David do that. You'd never see David do that. You see David sin. You never see David sin. You know what? I think I'm going to go worship Buddha. I think I'm going to go worship, you know, the Hindu gods. I think I'm going to go worship, name it, the gazillion gods that we all erect in our head. Not David. David loved and was devoted to one true and living God all his life. And that was simultaneous 
with his stumbling into sinful relationships that led to murder. You see now what I mean by the love of God is the only thing that can keep you from being dis, uh, detracted and torn apart into 50,000 pieces because of your sin. Do you guys get that? The love of God is the only thing that can hold you together when you're the sinner that you are. Like, because like nobody else can remedy your sin. David has sequenced down into a state of utter darkness for a small period of time, did he not? And God recovered him, didn't he? Well, Solomon is about to expand that on a superficial level by engaging in massive idolatry. And yet God will recover him too. Am I making sense? Now, this is extremely important on a personal level because you, again, if you and I are not capable of comprehending the nature of God's immutable and dominable love to redeem us from our sinfulness, then you and I have no hope of the redemption that, that we need from our sin. We will actually betray ourselves, which is what a lot of people do. This is called self-sabotage. A man or a woman who is in the throes of guilt for their sin will destroy themselves under the throes of guilt for their sin unless the grace of God intervenes. This is Judas Iscariot. He could not overcome betraying the son of the living God and just simply go back to Jesus and say, Jesus, I screwed up, man. Now, had he said that, would Jesus have received him? You better know it. It would have been a, a picosecond switch. Come on, let's go. I got you, right? But he didn't have the grace to own his sin to convert. So he went out and did what? Killed himself. All right. The only solution to our evilness sin is the grace of God. Verse 7. The, uh, then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Amnon. Verse 8. And likewise did he for all of his strange wives, which burnt incenses and sacrificed unto their gods. Let's keep walking through as we can finish this. And the Lord was what with Solomon? And the Lord was what? Again, so, so, can you love somebody and be angry with them? Okay. All right. So you, one of the things I like to demolish are what are called faulty bifurcations, <clears throat> category distinctions that are irreconcilable. So if you say, if you love me, you wouldn't be angry with me. That's a lie. I, because I love you, I am angry. Right? Because we talked about that a while back with this. I told you that anger is a quality of God that is required for every believer to mandate and desire and pursue righteousness, which is the grounds of reconciliation and the recovery of brokenness. Does that make some sense? Right. So when something gets broken, whether it's me breaking me or me breaking a relationship or a relationship breaking with me, Anger is mandating justice. Is that true? Right. And so justice is really about the reconciliation of the re relationship on the grounds of righteousness so that restoration can take place and we can keep it moving. Well, the solution then to anger as a consequence of righteousness is the mercy of God in Christ. Is it not? Atonement employed where the guilt of the crime is committed so that repair occurs and restoration between the two parties is established and now we can keep it moving. That's called the agape love of God. Agape. Alright, so I'm just letting you I'm letting you guys understand you don't you don't want to jump over verses unless you really have the uh, theological categories understood. Otherwise you, you're gonna really struggle and you really want to be able to understand these things. So and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared unto him twice. Verse ten. And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not which that which the Lord had commanded. You guys see that? 
Right. And so this is a commentary, really, that was more fleshed out during the time in which Solomon was building the temple. And his father, David, actually brought Solomon before everybody and laid out the covenant terms before everybody that God is going to take my son Solomon. He's going to be great among you and he's going to serve you. Now, you and Solomon and all the people, if you serve the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength, God will bless you. But. In the day that you turn away from the Lord, your God, God will begin to judge you. He will begin to punish you. He will separate you from him. He will allow the enemy to come in. He will take away your rest. And if you persist in rebelling against him, he will send you into captivity into far, far nations that you have not known before. Now, this is what we call the covenant love of God, because this is the Mosaic covenant that Israel was under, was it not? So I'm echoing Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus chapter 26. All God was saying is, I'm the husband, you the wife. If you obey me, we cool. If you act a fool in my house, I'm going to divorce you. Is that making sense? All right, so the love of God is covenantal and it allows us to understand the stipulations by which the blessings occur. And this is why Israel was always called an unfaithful wife. Was she not? An unfaithful wife, an unfaithful wife. And then all of a sudden, what did God do? Divorced her. I'm sorry, not all of a sudden. It took some 400 years. Just what we're dealing with right now, and again, I wish I had time, I'll do it on Friday. What we're dealing with right now are 42 20 on one end, 20 on another end, and two in the middle. We're dealing with 42 kings, okay? 42 kings. The 42 kings are the 42 kings of Israel and what? Judah. Now, the 42 kings were all viewed as one until Solomon committed the act that he did. Right here is where the kingdom would be divided. Does that make some sense? Right, right here would be where the kingdom would be divided. And so under the kingdom, uh, the kingdom trouble divided we stand, <clears throat> we begin to see this over in 1 Kings 11, verse, um, verse 13. Start at verse 13. I want to walk through this and make this plain so we can run with it on Friday. How be it, I will not, okay, go back to verse 12, because verse 12 is going to pick it up. First Kings 11, 12. Notwithstanding, in your days will I not, mm, so, okay, notwithstanding, okay, go back to verse 10. Maybe it's hidden in verse 10. I didn't see that. And he commanded concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which he commanded is not there. So go to verse 11. Now pick up what he's going to say. Wherefore, the Lord said to Solomon, there it is, for as much as this is done of thee, and you have not kept my commandments and statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely what? I will surely what? Now the word rend tear means to divide. If I had one garment and I did this, ugh, I would divide the garment. So now I want you to watch this because I want you to capture it in more economic terms so we can go forward. The rending of the kingdom is the act of a sovereign God. It's God's choice besides killing Solomon and everybody in Israel. You with me? Okay. Say, so Pastor, develop that. Okay, good, great, great. Right, because I don't assume that you understand or, or that you fully know. So the wages of sin is what? Yeah. So anytime God doesn't kill us, he's having mercy. Did that come home? So I'm, I'm going to develop a little bit more. I want you to get it. So I got 10 minutes. So this is where I'm going to sit. I'm going to have to work through the division on Friday. I'm going to show you how we have now started a cycle of division. A cycle of division. So to whom much is given, much is what? So leaders are called to actually follow God, are they not? Secular leaders, sacred leaders, I don't care who you are. God's telling you to obey him because God put you in that position. So if a leader acts a fool, doesn't he receive more stripes than the common people? All right. So but stay here with me because I'm getting ready to do some psychology and I think you're going to affirm me because we live in Solomon's day today. 
This would be a message to preach. So we live in a pluralistic society of syncretism and compromise and idolatry. So men and women actually believe that they can assert that they have their own way to God. These are idolatrous thoughts. Every man is a God to himself that says, I, I've carved out my own way to God. All right, you're an idolater. You're just a little God. Well, that's what Solomon does with the convenience of a thousand women. You guys do know it's 700 wives, 300 concubines. You do know that, right? And, and so um, I believe that was literal. Um, uh, quite convenient in God's sovereignty is the number 1,000 because the number 1,000 is the number of completion. We will talk about that when we look at Solomon's kingdom as a picture of the Antichrist era because that's what it is. It's a picture of the Antichrist era. Solomon ubiquitously holds a glorious picture of the prosperity of the kingdom of God in Christ in the age in which men and women are coming to Christ and are being blessed with that, 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 um, that language, every man under his vine tree and under, under his fig tree. That is what is called eschatological blessing. We know that in Solomon. We just read that streets of silver and of gold and wealth and prominence. But now all of a sudden, Solomon is what? I, this is Pastor Jesse's phraseology. Are you ready? Acting a what? Fool. This come from Louisiana. I hope y'all understand that. That's what we say. When you, when you just lose your mind, you're acting a fool. Solomon lost his mind, didn't he? And, and so what he did in his latter days was allow his heart to be turned from Jehovah to his wives. Isn't that what God said? That was God's assessment. All right. So does anybody know how that works? All right. Good. We can keep it moving. Right. Because if you if you don't know how it works, you're not paying attention to the subtle temptations of your own heart. Um, and so Solomon has engaged in this practice. And you and I can you and I can ferret this out. We can we can massage this out. We can go first one. How long did it take between the time that Solomon was coronated king with David, took the kingdom, built the temple, the fame went abroad, people came to Solomon, all of the stuff you just read in chapter uh, chapter 10 and 11. How long did it take? You, 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 you don't know. You're going to make an assertion, it's fine. What you know is it didn't take place in one week. He didn't go one week from blessing the Lord receiving riches, fame around the world, relationships with nations all over the place, which would have included wives. We know that. That was just a fundamental to the monarchy. So first question is, how long does it take to go from being in God's favor to being in God's disfavor? It's not meant to be answered quantitatively. It's meant to be answered psychologically. Am I making some sense? It's meant to be answered in the context of how you and I can gradually shift from the blessings of God being clear in our heart as what he's doing for us to us now kind of operating out of the presumption of those blessings. We can go from enjoying God for his blessings to enjoying the blessings from God. And then we can go from enjoying the blessings from God to forgetting God and worshiping the blessings. That'll come home because that's exactly what happened with those wives. So at some point and see if you want the book that's going to explain that it's going to be Ecclesiastes. So Solomon gave you Proverbs and Proverbs is beautiful because Proverbs said don't do it. Ecclesiastes is going to tell you now this is what's going to happen if you do do it. I love it. It is the confession of a king. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Woe to the man who is drawn in the, into the woman whose hands are bands and nets and fetters. Whosoever is not loved of God will be taken by her. Do you understand? That's, that's Ecclesiastes. You know what Solomon just said? The only reason I'm not in hell now is because God loved me up out of that. I'm quoting Ecclesiastes 7. All right, so I'm showing you how Solomon is admitting that he fell prey to this horrid practice 
that was so massive that it has to be understood in greater levels of complexity than you and I would assert. You know, Solomon was just kicking it one day at the club and just started seeing these chicks and then all of a sudden he went on a run. No, it didn't happen like that. Because <laughs> we, can, we can be shallow, couldn't we? We can be shallow. No, he's a king and there are many things going on in his life on an administrative level that puts him into contacts, contact, contact with fabulously phenomenal experiences that begin to change the passion of his heart. Phenomenal experiences. Experiences for which you and me, as poor pauper citizens, you know how we, well, Lord, I love to live large. Let me live like, like Mark Zuckerberg. Nah, nah. Now, you, now you'd perish right away. Let me live like uh, Warren Buffett. No, 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 no. You'd perish right away. Let me live like the billionaires and the trillionaires. No, 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 no. You'd perish right away. Pastor, how do you know? Because God hasn't given that to you. That's how we know. He loves you enough not to give it to you. Now, let me keep going for a minute because I want you to understand Solomon's dilemma and, 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 and why Solomon was able to get away with it. He was able to get away with it not because God is slack and not because God doesn't care and not because God doesn't warn. You know that's true. You know when we be messing up, God knows. You know when we be messing up, God cares. You know when we be messing up, God taps us on the shoulder. You know when we be messing up, God will pop us on our head. You know when we be messing up, God will rattle the door. You know when we be messing up, he will rattle our cage. What that means is Solomon had warnings all the way through the process. Third thing. Solomon had to have had conflicts with the good men in his administration. See, now I'm just, I'm bringing this home, right? Because Washington is tore up, but it's not completely tore up. We know there are good men in Washington, right? Like there are good men almost in all places. But when the majority has actually leavened out and become corrupt, then the echelon of the hierarchy will actually do atrocious things. Does that make some sense? Does that make some sense? So at a certain point, Solomon paid no attention to the prophets or the priest or the good people that were around him. Does that make sense? Thirdly, when leadership starts to compromise in terms of the explicit biblical parameters by which you and I are to be responsible with our blessings, particularly because people are watching us. So I'm going to bring this down to every home is a kingdom. I'm going to make an application. Every home is a kingdom. Every house is a kingdom. Every, every mother is a queen. Every husband is a king. Every son and daughter are princes and princesses. Yeah. And so when we, when we, begin to compromise the standards that should come from the top down, we're training everybody to be like us. You must believe at a certain point that the leaven that was happening in Solomon's life was accepted by a good constituency of the politic of Israel. Did y'all understand what I just stated? As the leaders... So are the people. So what was happening in the monarchy, which was freshly 80 to 100 years old. This is the kingdom before it's divided. 40 years for Saul, 40 years for David, 40 years for Solomon. That's 120 years. That's a small period of time for a kingdom. Remember, we have moved from the patriarchy, the judicial system, to the monarchy. Are you with me? And everybody wanted the monarchy, didn't they? Yeah. They all wanted the monarchy. 
We all want a king to represent us. We don't want you to represent us, God. We, we want a king. We, don't, we want a real man. We want a real human being. You want to put all that weight on a real human being to do what only God can do. So then with all of the weight of that administration sitting on his shoulders and here comes the glory and Solomon is living large. He's got 50 Denali's. He's got Lexuses. He's got all Mercedes Benz. He's got Rolls Royces, right? He's got spotlights. He's the man. We're killing him. We're killing him. Did y'all get that? We're killing him. So Solomon probably for many of the people in Israel became an idol. And this is what's happening in our country over the last 40 or 50 years with the way in which we have treated our presidents. Am I teaching? Yes. Right. And, and it's really important because once we exalt them to the level that they are no longer just a representative of the whole people group as a president, but now he's a rock star, she's a rock star, they're like a monarch, they're like a king, you can't expect them to do anything but act like it. And so for a long time now, our presidents have been acting like monarchs. And we have functioned in America like the divided kingdom and the monarchies. We swing to the left and we got a rock star king and Bill Clinton. We swing to the right and we got a rock star king and George Bush. Swing, swing. This is what I've taught you many times, the dialectical process. This is the same plantation. One, one master's red, one master's blue, same plantation. And that model divides us because we have unduly exalted them to statuses that they don't deserve. And then you wonder why they act the fool that they do. So here is why God rent the kingdom. Y'all with me? He rent the kingdom in order to save the seed. So what we're going to pick up on on Friday is how God is going to allow the 10 northern tribes of Jerusalem, of Israel, the 10 northern tribes to constantly fight with the two southern tribes. These two are going to be fighting. Do you understand that? They're going to be fighting. Now it's going to be 20 kings for Israel and 20 kings for Judah. Nice even number. 20 kings for Israel, 20 kings for Judah. From 970 BC to 587 BC, these kings are going to be fighting. You guys got that? Then we got two really silly queens. One is Jezebel, and then her daughter, is, her name is what? Athaliah. And I'm going to show you how when a kingdom is divided, it will also destroy the model of governance that God sets up by Jezebel and Athaliah. And yet in all of this craziness, and this is a model of our country, because we're pushing towards some female president because we have we have just completely destroyed the distinction between male and female you guys do know that right that's over with so the queens Jezebel and Athaliah gonna just about destroy Israel but God has a plan of course he does that's how we're saved God has a plan of course he does so that's what we're gonna pick up on Friday as we continue to make our way through the Davidic kingdom all right we got to take a break right here